it's going to be a separate Zoom call, but this Zoom call will be live during that period. Um, and with the protocol that I've been advised, if I could take attendance and the commissioners, as I mentioned, your name say here, my name is Robert Burke, I'm the chairman. Um, Can I just interrupt you for one second? Um, yes. Deborah Freed just sent me a text. She's trying to get in. So I told, maybe she doesn't realize there are two meetings. So I told her, look for the first meeting. Okay. Okay. Um, I guess we'll just get her when she comes in. I don't, yeah, I don't see her coming in yet. Okay. Um, Dr. Desir? Here, present. And Steve Felsigno. Steve, are you present? Steve? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Yes, sorry. Um, so the first item of the agenda is, for the Board of Police Commissioners is an executive session to discuss personal matters um, for a potential dispatch candidate. Um, so if the commissioners could um, exit this meeting and go to the uh, executive session Zoom meeting, and then we'll reconvene and come back. Um, I'm hoping everyone has the chief's uh, cell phone number in the event that they can't get back in. Do you both have his cell number? I'm pretty sure I do, because I called him once when there was a fire around the corner. Okay. Um, well, 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 I guess we can always contact you if, if we don't see you again. So you can just make sure you get off this and come back in. Um, all right. I'm all right. I'll see you guys in a few moments. Hey, um, Rob, I think yes. you need a motion, Rob. I'm sorry. Is there a motion to enter into executive motion, session? Yes, a motion to move into executive session. Um, I'm going to second that motion. Um, one, two, three, we one. can't vote on it because Dr. Sear left already. Um, you know something? We're going to do it... Um, we're going to do it after we come back. Frank. Uh, Chief. Okay. All right. Um, so, so do you want me to exit or not? I want you to exit and then we'll go to the other meeting. Um, and just if we can reiterate, there was a unanimous vote by the commissioners to extend an offer of employment to Jennifer Arpino as a dispatcher. I, I apologize, Chief. Yeah, no worries. Uh, so that's where we are with the finance report. I mean, a couple um, of the lines are a little bit higher. The first one is the overtime on the police side. Um, and with that, a good portion of the funding is attributed to the recent tropical storm that lasted several um, days and uh, expecting that to be reimbursed to the town through FEMA. How much um, is that, Chief, do you know? Just that was uh, about $14,000. That's about 50% of your overtime budget, right? Or, or what you've fixed. Um, yeah, that, it was uh, $14,400 um, from that, from the fourth uh, through the- I would, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, um, you know, I, I, I did take a look at the, um, and, and I know that there's a lot of interesting things going on in the world right now. Um, but, you know, as, as always, I'm kind of the hawk when it comes to the overtime, and that's just kind of jumped out at me. I'm glad we're getting reimbursed for half of it. Um, but, and I, I assume that now that we're hiring another dispatch, the overtime should be uh, back in line on the dispatch line, the overtime for the dispatch. Once we get a, this, uh, our new uh, dispatcher up and running, well, it, uh, eventually it will be, but one of the the other dispatcher, the newest dispatcher prior to tonight's hiring, um, she hasn't been cut loose yet to minimum manpower uh, due to training requirements. Some that were extended through um, overextended because of the COVID and, and things like that, um, the classroom part of that. But uh, she's expected to be cut loose if everything goes <clears throat> on track in the next few days or so at the start of the next bid on October 4th. So that'll give us five full-time dispatchers on. Um, yeah. And then when this new one's hired, our new one's hired, 
Uh, she just has to get some um, updates on a bunch of certifications, but she'll be able to work in, in um, pretty much as a call taker until she gets her full uh, dispatch certification. So she'll be up front as well. Right. But yes, uh, we should be heading in the right direction, you know, because as you know, we've been we've been going since probably last July. Um, right, sure that's dispatcher. So that's what uh, really impacted us on the dispatch over there. Okay. That's about it for the financial. That's, but that's the only thing that jumps out at me. Yeah, uh, those are the two two main ones right now. I mean, the other, there's other things that you're, you know, that you're, you know, your percentage use is, the percentage used is way up, but they're, you know, kind of small potatoes in a $3 million budget. So, you know, right, that, and those are a lot of things that get paid up front and so on and so forth, correct. That's all for the financial report. Are there any other questions of Chief Capiello? Is there a motion to approve the financial report? Motion to approve. Second. Uh, any further questions or discussion? All those in favor? Okay, unanimous. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the activity report. So for activity um, in July uh, and August, between July and August, we have three different uh, burglaries. Uh, Beginning of July or mid-July, we had a uh, commercial burglary on the Lower Amity Road area where a window was broken in the overnight hours and uh, business was entered and uh, fortunately they left the cash drawer empty so nothing was taken. Then the next day, uh, right after that following day, we had another commercial burglary. About 9.30 p.m. they responded to an activated alarm at a business um, on Lower Amity Road as well. And the same, um, same kind of ammo that the window was uh, broken and a perpetrator entered the premises and stole. Set up for the forensic lab for, for analysis. So that's all pending. And then in August, we had one burglary uh, at a house for sale on Shady Lane in town. The house was vacant, but had several showing. And that remains under investigation. We had a, uh, approximately 20 different uh, cases where motor vehicles were entered uh, between July and August, actually 11 in July and 9 in August at various locations throughout town. Same uh, problem that many of the neighborhood uh, communities are experiencing. In our cases, all but one of those were unlocked, vehicles were <coughs> running. Um, a lot of times the complainants didn't even want to see the police. They just want to make us aware of it. Um, in the one case um, that the car was, was locked, the window was broken, but there had been a, a purse left in uh, plain view. And all those seemed to be happening in the overnight, early morning hours, but with no, um, no real pattern, just uh, scattered th uh, throughout town. But the, the main takeaway from that is, you know, like we've been saying, and, and everyone's been saying, it's and it's so important to um, lock your cars and take the keys. Uh, we had two larcenies um, in the beginning of July. We had a house entered in the deep wood road area of town where a portable generator was stolen out of a garage. Um, and another um, uh, incident on the lower uh, Route 69 area where some accessories were stolen off of, off of a car. We had three stolen vehicles uh, over the past two months, on the 28th of uh, July, and during the overnight hours, we had a vehicle taken from a driveway on Maple Terrace. A uh, vehicle had left the keys in it, unlocked, and it was recovered several days later unoccupied in New Haven. And then on the parking lot of uh, a Bradley Road business during the overnight hours, um, and a second vehicle was actually recovered um, in the parking lot there was left behind. That vehicle had previously been stolen out of Waterbury. Um, and the vehicle that was stolen from Woodbridge that day was uh, found about a week later in New Haven. <clears throat> and then on the 21st um, of August, we had a vehicle reported by a resident, initially reported as stolen. The vehicle was put out as stolen, located, um, and found damaged in another town in the parking lot. Subsequent investigation um, 
they were able to uh, confirm that it was a falsely reported incident, that the vehicle had been involved in an accident, the owner reported it stolen when it was not, and um, he was subsequently, uh, subsequently charged accordingly with that. Just a quick update from ISU. They had, um, ISU received three positive gunshot residue confirmation from the state forensics laboratory. And that was pertaining to the arrest of three subjects um, in connection with the <clears> shot fire <throat> or back in March. You might recall that had happened around 11, 11 p.m. or so at the intersection of Litchfield and Bradley um, when numerous um, shots were fired and uh, house was hit in, uh, along with a parked vehicle. Subsequently, um, they were able to make an arrest with the assistance of the state police um, of some subjects in a car that were trying to flee the area. Um, so that portion of the arrest was made and another arrest warrant will be submitted now for um, the unlawful dis uh, discharge portion of that investigation. And then also a arrest warrant was served for a firearms case involving some subjects who fled from the scene of a motor vehicle accident back in April, which occurred on lower route 69. Um, they got some forensics back from the lab with a DNA hit um, on the firearm that was recovered at the scene there. Um, we made an arrest on that and the US Attorney's Office um, subsequently adopted the case um, in an attempt to curb the uptick in violence that's been plaguing the greater New Haven area uh, for the past several months. And the subject in our case there was um, indicted, indicted federally. Also, um, ISU had throughout July and August that a real uh, high quantity of, uh, of uh, fingerprint requests. They had 26 fingerprint requests <clears throat> for different reasons and, and an additional 36 requests for uh, pistol permits that were processed during that uh, two month period. That's, that's about all for the uh, criminal activity. <clears throat> then moving on to uh, the traffic uh, activity, uh, the deputy chief was just going to follow up on that a little bit. Are you there? All right, Frank, there's, there's not much to say. Uh, motor vehicle activity through July and August uh, was very limited, um, probably due to uh, restrictions that were put uh, together by the chief back in March or March 18th of 2020. Since March of this year, motor vehicle activity has stayed consistent with restrictions put in place due to the several issues, uh, but are not limited to the pandemic, police reform, as well as safety of the officers and the public. Um, that kind of basically tells the story of activity. If I mean, if you look at the numbers, they're, they're, they're not really high or, um, or consistent what they were back in February of this year. Um, but that's about it uh, for motor vehicle activity, unless you have any questions. So you're telling me all month long, we had three motor vehicle stops. Is that what I'm reading? Uh, in July, actually, actually eight, eight in the in the month of uh, of August. So yet, so you have, and I'm just, and and, I'm, and I understand, and maybe the commit um, commissioner Burke wants to. Um, Maybe he has a, a, a an explanation for this, um, or maybe well, sir, maybe it's been discussed. But Steve, you, sir, certainly, you have, there's certainly yeah. there's there's there is a concern about motor vehicle activity. Yeah. But uh, like I indicated, if if you should have had a copy of the March 18th, you know, um, COVID 19 modified operating protocol that was put in place, and we're going back to March, so and things have gotten even worse since March, um, and specific, to, you know, to that. Those modifications was the contact with the public was to be limited. Distance was uh, only as practical or, or as necessary. And then traffic stops should be carefully balanced between public safety avoiding unnecessary contact. We are, we're, we, are, we do provide a strong visible uh, police presence on the busy roads and, and uh, the busy intersections during the peak hours. We've been, you know, high visibility and mobility. But as far as actually stopping cars, we we that's very very limited. And Most I, of your activity that you see on on the uh, monthly activity statistics is is due to um, accidents, 
and accidents are actually down as well. Okay. Can you hear me at all, uh, Ray? Ray, can you hear me? Yeah, I hear you fine. I hear you. Yes. So, again, this just goes back to numbers to me, which, so if you're telling me that in the month of August you made eight stops, all right, and I understand that you have $31,000 in police overtime, 14 of which is going to be reimbursed. It just seems to me if, if you have three police officers on each shift or a, mi a minimum mandatory, um, you have a sergeant and two officers, right? That's that's minimum, am I right? And you're making only eight stops. There should really, yeah. really be no overtime. All right. I mean, and if and to have to have fourteen or fifteen thousand dollars in overtime, because that's what it's unrelated to any storms. It just seems to me that that um, that the overtime should be pretty close to zero. If you're only making eight stops a month, where in the past you made what was the average a year ago in August and July? It was. Um, Steve, yeah, but Steve, the, the overtime that's, that's the reported overtime is, is not really in direct correlation with motor vehicle that. stops or activity by the officers as far as stopping vehicles. Frank, well, you you probably could you know relate to right. you know what the what have the to explain that to me because it just the overtime was. I mean, I'm not a cop, so I don't understand it. I, I I understand the numbers, and it just seems to me that that would be, you know, something. There's no there should be no correlation between the old. Motor vehicle stops has nothing to do with the overtime. They're totally two separate, two separate things. Okay. Well, I'm just saying in the past, it was always, you know, part of it was because they have a, a, a vehicle stop and they have to do their paperwork. And sometimes it goes over a shift and I, I'm not, I'm just, I'm just asking the question. I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I'm just saying, I'm not saying I'm right or wrong. I'm just asking the question, trying to understand it. I guess, Steve, is your question that if if a certain number is based on overtime, absent storm related issues, what's the overtime for? I mean, what, how do we attribute the overtime? Right, and what I'm saying is, in the past, um, where we had so so many more traffic stops, one of the reasons in the past that there was so much overtime was um, you know, due to so many traffic stops accidents, things like that, and people having to write up reports, and sometimes it took hours to do, and I understood all that. It just seems to me that with making eight stops in the month of August, it just seems it just seems that, that the 14, to have 12 or $14,000 in overtime um, just doesn't correlate numerically to me, and and if, if you're telling me that it's for other reasons, then it's for other reasons, and, and I, I mean, you guys are running the department. I certainly, you know, and you know, listen and, and earnestly try to understand the uh, the numbers. So. so that's all I'm saying. Just something to, as always, keep an eye on. I guess. But. Well, certainly, Steve. I, I think off the top of my head, I, I I wasn't hearing what Frank had to say about the overtime, but. To me, it's 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 caused by you know obviously we've had some consistent overtime because of the, the weather we've had, um, and that's usually where the where the overtime is is used or, or uh, um, shortage of officers being off, but not not really a direct correlation with with uh, motor vehicle stops, unless a, an investigation ensues. <clears throat> Okay. Listen, I mean, yeah. Yeah, Steve. All, all our overtime, it had, the majority of that, like I told you, had to do with the storm. Um, you know, one day we had, we had assigned an officer at the uh, at the polls for the election primary. That's fourteen hours, you know, out, out of our overtime budget right there. Um, and the rest are to cover staffing shortages and uh, in cases that come that come through. And I can, if you like, we could talk offline. And I'd, no, that's fine. Share you know a thorough breakdown with you of what what it all is attributed to. That's fine. Are there any other questions of no deputy or chief? No thanks. Is there a motion to approve the activity reports? So moved. Is there a second?
Debbie, Steve, second. Did you get a second? No. Yeah. I'll, I'll second. We, okay. Um, any further discussion? All those in favor? It's unanimous. Um, okay. Next time the agenda is the report. The first uh, topic that I had was uh, regarding the dispatch, dispatch consultant. So as you know, several months ago, probably right at the start or thereabouts of the, uh, of the pandemic, the town hired a dispatch consultant to perform a review of dispatch um, and to provide a comprehensive report to the Board of Selectmen that outlines his recommendations based on industry standards and best practices. And then also to um, give his recommendations out and how, or let them know some suggestions as how to best achieve the recommendations that he, he might make. The gentleman, Mike Boucher of um, Mike Boucher Consulting and Training, he's a communications training, he was a communications training officer and emergency telecommunicator from uh, Farmington PD who recently retired. Um, he's also a volunteer fireman for the town of Burlington, Connecticut. He has started his assessment and he visited the, visited the police department uh, twice now. He was here on, last on uh, August 25th, I believe. And he spent some time up in front um, doing observation with our dispatchers during B squad and into uh, the evening C squad shift. He seems very knowledgeable and um, look forward to working with him and uh, hearing his recommendations and suggestions as we move forward with that. Next topic I had was the uh, Beecher Road School Ad Hoc Security and SRO Committee. And just a, an update, I, I had, uh, brought this to the board's attention back in June. Um, myself and uh, Commissioner Freed were both asked to participate um, as members of the Woodbridge Board of Ed's Ad Hoc uh, Committee. Some of the other members include uh, formerly uh, Superintendent Gilbert, who um, recently retired and now, now this, uh, the, the new interim um, Superintendent Christine Suriak will be taking over. Um, school's principal, Lisa Sherman. There's also representatives from the Board of Finance, the Board of Woodbridge Board of Ed, some parents at large, the Woodbridge Education Association, the Board of Finance, um, and the PTO. So the charge of the committee is to make a recommendation to the Board of Ed um, pertaining to security personnel needs and costs for the uh, fiscal 2021-22 budget. So they'll have some ideas of how they want to proceed with that. Uh, we've only had a limited number of discussions and meetings so far. Uh, things got pushed back a little, probably with um, Bob Gilbert's retirement and then the school's preparation um, for the reopening that's going on now, you know, everything in conjunction with the pandemic. But I'll keep you advised of, um, you know, any future meetings and that are scheduled and what transpires during them so that we'll be uh, prepared as we will be prepared to uh, prepare our budget here at the police commission um, accordingly as well. So that's uh, where we're at with that. There hasn't really been a lot of progress with that. <clears throat> Next topic regards our, our participation with the, the Milford uh, special response team. So several years ago, or probably many years ago now, 2007, 2008 or thereabouts, the police departments from the towns of Milford, Orange, West Haven, Yassoni, and Woodbridge um, formed a group that uh, became known as the Southwest Regional Response Team, Special Response Team, and they trained together to to, um, to respond to high risk, you know, tactical type situations. So as time went on over the years, many of the towns dropped out for various different reasons: staffing, funding, inactivity. Um, for some of the reasons. For the past few years, the team had been down to personnel from only Milford, Orange, and Woodbridge. Um, most recently, Orange PD ended its participation. So then the team was just down to two officers from Woodbridge that participated, and the remainder of the team were all um, from the Milford PD. So it really wasn't so much a regional team, it was more of a Milford team, and um, with our two guys participating. Um, Fast forward, you know, into more recent times with the budget cuts and our um, reduction in staffing this year, and now a return of our two SROs to the school. 
there's no way that, you know, I could really um, maintain our commitment to training with the team and at the same time maintain our daily staffing levels without having to spend the um, large amount of overtime, which, you know, quite frankly, we don't have. So the reality of it is that it um, has become no more cost effective for us to participate with that team. So for those reasons, most recently, I've decided to end our participation um, in that as well. Um, I reached out and I discussed my decision with you know, Chief Melwell and Milford, and he fully, you know, fully under, understood the funding aspect. And um, as he, like all of us, are experiencing the same, same kind of challenges and restrictions. And then I also discussed it with our two current members, and just want to acknowledge them, Officer Brian Petalino and Officer Matt Lima, and they, they pretty much understood the reality of the decision and kind of saw, that, saw it coming. Um, but I'd like to formally acknowledge their you know, dedication and professionalism and commitment um, to the team while they did participate it. And you know, they represented our department well um, in their participation with the team. And moving forward, you know, most recently we've been, you know, we've been doing um, active shooter training yeah, on a regional basis with the police departments from our immediate uh, vicinity. Um, Ansonia, Derby, Seymour, and Bethany. So we're hoping to continue that as we move forward. And should we need the services of a you know, special response tactical team, we'll reach out and uh, request the services of the Connecticut State Police uh, SWAT team moving forward. With that. And the last topic I had was um, our uh, post uh recent audit by the Police Academy. So back in 2008, new legislation um, had been enacted stating that effective January 1st, 2019, all Connecticut law enforcement agencies would be required to adopt and maintain certain standards and practices that were developed by the um, Connecticut Police Officers Standards and Training Council. Back uh, just a few weeks ago on August 24th, the program manager from the state post council came to our department to review our general orders. This year, they ordered 16 different areas of policy ranging from um, topics of family violence, pursuit, police misconduct, bias-based policing, missing persons, electronic defense weapons, body-worn cameras, missing, perpen, missing, missing persons, um, uh, right through to the use of force amongst several other uh, different areas. And their goal and objective was to determine um, if our agency had the proper policies in place, to determine if our policies were current and up to date, and to determine if our policies were being adhered to. So I'm pleased to report that last week we received the formal notification from post council that our agency passed the state's audit. We satisfied all the uh, mandated requirements uh, pertaining to the compliance to law enforcement standards and practice, uh, practices programs, the CLESP, uh, CLESP, uh, CLESP audit. So we're good to go with that and we'll just keep um, updating our orders as uh, things keep changing and we move forward. That's about all I have. <clears throat> Any questions? Is there a motion to approve the report of the chief? So moved. A approve. second. Any discussion? All those in favor? I see unanimous hands. Thank you. Okay. Um, next item is the personal matters. Um, there are three items, extended absence, a carryover of vacation time, unused, and letters of recognition. So, so the first topic, uh, extended absence, just want to make the board aware that one of our officers has um, notified me that he and his wife are expecting the birth of their child um, at the end of the month. And subsequently, he's planning to take an extended absence utilizing accrued time off inclusive of his sick time and vacation time. And he'll be doing that through the uh, months of both October and December. So it'll be short for, um, for some time during those months. <clears throat> the second topic um, was a request to carry over unused vacation time. Um, due to our workload, the ongoing COVID pandemic and associated quarantine um, period that had arisen, uh, Janice has, request, has 
requested permission to carry over 10 vacation days beyond her upcoming anniversary date, which is September 18th. She's been trying to use her vacation time as possible. And at the same time, trying to you know, ensure proper coverage to our office. So at times she's limited to when she could take it um, and as she fulfills all her other responsibilities. Um, most recently, the town came out with a new directive eliminating uh, vacation carryovers, uh, which unfortunately came out um, not too long ago. So it's in close proximity to her anniversary date. So I look for the board's um, consideration for Janice to carry over these. If I can interject. Um, so this is a new direction forward, am I right? Yes. yes. So it's, it would be pretty unfair to impose Janice with such a short window and make it virtually impossible for her to use that. My suggestion would be to make an exception for Janice and extend it through the end of the year so that she has the opportunity to use those days. And then um, going forward, uh, make sure that we comply with the new directive going forward. So I had a discussion with our first selectman, Beth Heller, and she, was, she informed me that at the department had meetings at both July and August of this year she had made an announcement that the, at the discretion of the first selectman that um, they were no longer allowing employees to carry over vacation days. So um, the, the problem I had is that Janice's anniversary date where she would be required to fulfill that is almost impossible because there's not enough time. Um, so they, the police department employees work on their, their individual anniversary dates Whereas the town employees, their vacation works on a calendar year. Um, so out of fairness, I had, we had discussed this and suggested that perhaps we should, you know, allow her to do it through the end of the year, at least to give her several months opportunity as opposed to depriving her of that opportunity to do that within too short a period of time. Um, First Life and Heller was okay with that. So um, if everyone else is okay with that, um, but this is, I have been told that um, this will not be granted again. That that was a strong directive from the you, town hall, I guess. Independently, it's our decision, but that's the, the policy that the town wants to maintain. Do we know why they shifted that? No. Okay. You uh, Do you need a motion? We do need a motion to... Um, I'll make a motion to uh, make a special exception for Janice due to her, uh, due to the, the uh, situation mentioned uh, previously about the uh, inability for her to uh, utilize her 10 vacation days by September 18th and give her a special exception to extend it through the end of the year, allowing her to um, utilize those vacation days between now and uh, December 31st. Wait, Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? I see all three hands unanimous. Thank you. Okay. Um, you know, last, the last topic I had, there were just a few letters of accommodation of rec in recognition that I'd like to uh, just put on the record. There was a letter of accommodation I issued to Sergeant RJ R. Scott, Officer Matthew Iannucci, Officer Frank Sapion, Officer John Lally, um, Sergeant Robert, Wachowski of the Connecticut State Police and Trooper John O'Connor and his canine Kaiser of the Connecticut State Police. Uh, that comes back from an incident back in March. Um, it relates to one that I mentioned in my earlier report, um, report of gunshots on the area of Route 69 in Bradley. Uh, shortly thereafter, the state police uh, uh, spotted a vehicle that we were looking for on Richfield Turnpike in Bethany. The vehicle was uh, followed back into Woodbridge where it was abandoned on the roadside. Um, subsequent search in the wooded area for, uh, for quite a period of time throughout that night uh, and during the heavy rain. And they were able to locate three suspects and um, make an arrest and uh, retrieve that stolen firearm. Um, a letter of re recognition to Officer Vincent Lynch um, for his uh, successful completion of another year of gear instruction. Um, especially when he's faced with the challenge this year of the current COVID um, global health pandemic. 
he was able to um, complete the year. And additionally, he was able to, um, in short notice, work with the school and develop a, an unprecedented uh, virtual deer graduation ceremony and um, acknowledge um, the hard work by the students um, and make that program um, a success. A letter of recognition was also issued to Officer Leo Capozo, and this is regards to his response to a medical emergency on June 5th. Uh, he's a state of Connecticut uh, recognized drug uh, drug, drug recognition, recognition expert, excuse me. And um, he noticed the symptoms of this patient as being uh, those of a narcotic overdose. He was able to administer Narcan, um, start use of the AED and uh, begin chest compressions. And shortly thereafter, he was uh, able to uh, assist the patient in, re in regaining consciousness and getting him off to the hospital. And um, because of his um, medical assistance, the victim assigned that, uh, the victim survived that incident. The unit citation went out to um, ISU Sergeant uh, A.J. Capiel, Detective Richard Monaco, and Detective Mike Leslie in connection with a bank robbery that happened at the TD Bank at 128 Amity Road back in February. Um, based on their invest investigation at that time, um, they were able to quickly make an arrest, secure an arrest warrant, identify the subject, and, um, and solve that case. And then a letter of commendation to Detective Mike Luzzi on March 20th. Um, he and other personnel responded to a report of a bank robbery at 128 Amity Road again. This was a report of a firearm being brandished. Shortly thereafter, a person who matched that description was seen by Officer Luzzi um, in the Westville section of New Haven. And upon approaching um, the suspect with the assistance of New Haven Police Department, the suspect tried to flee. Uh, he was taken into custody after a brief chase and uh, they recovered a firearm a replica and, um, and the money seized from the bank robbery. And then a uh, letter of recognition went to Officer Brian Petalino and Officer Carl Rodriguez Perez, acknowledging their um, continual uh, support of the community with um, charity work. Uh, they did uh, a short notice this year in conjunction with the pandemic they put together a touch of truck um, uh, video presentation for the, the kids and their families for the JCC. And they're always stepping up to spearhead different uh, volunteer things that we participate in, um, collecting food, collecting donations at the holidays um, and No Shave November. So I just want to um, recognize all of them for a job uh, well done. And that's, uh, that's all on the personnel. Thank you, Chief. That ends all of the matters on our agenda. Is there a motion to adjourn the police commission meeting? Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? All those in favor? I see three hands. That's unanimous. Thank you. Welcome to the Woodbridge Traffic Authority. It is 7.33 p.m. Um, first item in the agenda is public comments. Are there anyone from the public that wishes to be heard? I see no one in here. No one. Janice, had anyone advised you that they wish to be heard at the traffic authority? Chief, is Janice with you? Well, yeah, I know you couldn't hear. Yes, she said no one um, advisor of any okay. public. Hearing. I couldn't hear her. Um, there are a couple items of uh, traffic matters. Yeah, so the first one, I just want to update the board on the situation with Sperry Road. So during the first weeks of, weeks of July, when the weather um, was very warm, we began, began having a significant increase of the use of Sperry Park, especially in the area of Sperry Falls. Um, we were told by some of the visitors there that the location of Sperry Park had been advertised on social media. So that's how suddenly groups of people um, began congregating there. Many of them were from out of town. They were, they were showing up at the park with coolers and bathing suits and uh, flotation devices, believe it or not. Um, so we were responding to various complaints regarding con groups congregating, parking issues, littering, um, you know, lack of social distancing, and people swimming illegally in the falls area. Um, we tried a bunch of alternatives, including increased patrols, 
um, additional signage was posted by the by the by both the water authority and um, the Sperry Park Commission and uh, John Adamovich, um, his affiliation with the Rec Department and the Sperry Park Commission. But the problems um, continued for a while. So on July 21st, working with in conjunction with the Sperry Park Commission, Town Hall, and Public Works, um, we all agreed that it would be best. Um, due to health and public safety concerns that the unimproved portion of Sperry Road, uh, the dirt portion there would be closed, similar to how we do it um, every year during the winter months. So um, with the gates at both ends being locked to prevent vehicular traffic, but pedestrians are still uh, welcome to walk through there. Um, all you know, emergency response personnel, the police, fire, and EMS, everybody has... Uh, a key so they would be able to have routine or emergency access should they need it. So with, with those efforts and you know with time now, the message seemed to have gotten out over the past several weeks and the problem at the park has um, subsided now that that's out. Um, but you know I do have to say we did have one incident just as recent as last week about 10:30 at night when um, four individuals you know went up to the park and they cut the, cut the chain to the fence to the uh, to the gate with a bull cutter and they were trespassing in the park at 10.30 p.m. So the problem that uh, arose with closing the gates initially was a parking um, at both ends of the park entrances. Once the gate uh, was closed, people were just leaving their cars there. The primary problem was on the north end where you access Ferry Road from Morris Road. Um, there was a house there, if you're familiar with it, it was previously owned by the um, Regional Water Authority and for years, now it had been vacant, so it was never really in, impacted when people parked there. So we never had any, any problem with it. But um, most recently now that home's all been remodeled and it's currently occupied. So the new owner has been in communication with um, myself several times and you know, with Town Hall and also with Warren Carlos from Public Works regarding the parking. So we've been working with her to make sure that her, um, her property and her access to her driveways um, isn't um, impacted too much. So we started putting up, you know, the cardboard um, temporary no parking signs and, it, you know, it helps so much, but somewhat, but they were, with the weather and all, they were um, getting destroyed. So long short of it is that Public Works recently um, seemed to have resolved the problems. They put up some more permanent signs for the time being on the gate and in the area there, and we'll continue to monitor it. And I'll stay in touch with the uh, homeowner there and keep you posted if any further issues arise um, with the parking that we might have to address with the traffic authority. But at this point for now, um, we seem to be good and in in, uh, things, things seem to be working out. Uh, the next topic I had was uh, just an update on uh, the intersection of Yamity Road, Route 63 at Bradley Road. Um, at the end of July, we were notified the, by the Connecticut Department of Transportation that they had received the request recently from Senator George Logan regarding that, uh, requesting that a traffic signal be installed at the unsignalized intersection of Amity and Bradley. Um, as you may recall, several previous official requests were made by the, by the Legal Traffic Authority um, in 2009, again in 2011, and again, since I've uh, been chief, that was in 2016. Um, the traffic authority requested a formal DLT study um, to investigate the possibility of putting a light at that, that intersection. Um, during their last review in, in 2016, the DLT reported that the previous studies that all denied the installation of the traffic um, signal at that intersection were all still valid since they say the traffic volume did not significantly change and that uh, their, their most recent traffic their most recent uh, crash data did not reveal any kind of crash patterns that would warrant a signal um, at that location. So that was the last and most recent stance by the DOT. But with that said, um, DOT advises that at the request of the Senator, they will be um, initiating another study of the intersection. And when that's completed, they'll notify us of um, their findings and we'll share that with the board and, um, and the town as well. <clears throat> Third issue was uh, I received a request uh, for use of the cul-de-sac again at the end of Research Drive. So back during our um, last meeting in July, the board received and approved a request from the owner of um, a business there, Ear Temple Arts, 
um, which is located at 11 Research Drive. Uh, the business that offers aerial dance and circus and movement classes uh, to use the cul-de-sac for an outdoor fundraiser and um, show and performance by their staff and students. They did, they held that event on August 15th and it went off without any uh, problems or incidents um, that we had to be involved in. Uh, there were no complaints received or anything like that. Um, last week, they submitted another request um, asking to use the cul-de-sac again on Saturday, October 10th, October 10th for two shows that they'd like to do at both 2 p.m. and 6 p.m. Um, similar to as they did last month, they plan on providing seating um, on the grass and parking lots around the area. Um, the estimated crowds are about 100 people. Um, as they did previously, they've gotten permission from the property owners to use the areas there. Um, that way they can ensure uh, that proper social distancing um, mandates are, uh, are, are met. They're proposing a rain date of Sunday, October 11th. Um, and if their request is approved this evening by, by the traffic authority, um, I'll let them know that they'll um, have to do the same thing that they had to do last uh, month and um, follow through with notification to and get the approval of the Board of Selectmen. So I present that to the board, uh, to the traffic authority tonight for your consideration of their request. Frank, is there any concern you have of us uh, approving that request? No, we, you know, as, as they did last time, they've been very thorough and um, staying in communication. We've actually gone back and forth to clarify a couple of matters over, even over the holiday weekend. So I have all the facts um, to present to you tonight. And um, there was no problem at their last, um, the last event they had and I don't anticipate and again, it's pretty low key. Um, Would you want that uh, you know, approval to be conditional in any way? Um, just that they run it by the board of, uh, by, through by the town hall and the board of selectmen. I know last time um, you requested a condition, uh, a certificate of insurance. Right. And, uh, right. They, they said they'd be more than willing to do that again if the if the town would like them to. So I guess that would probably fall upon the um, board of selectmen. So I'll, I'll, once we allow them to use the road, if that if that passes, I'll refer them to the next step to. to uh, approach the Board of Selectmen as they did last time. Did we ask them for a certificate of insurance last time or was that the Board of Selectmen? Uh, we told them that they would probably have to request, uh, present that to the Board of Selectmen. Okay. Not to us. Is there a motion to permit the use of the calls to say? I moved. Is there a second? Second. Um, all those in favor? We lost Commissioner Felsigno. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I approve. I don't know if you can hear me or not. We have Commissioner Felsigno. Okay, unanimous. Thank you. And the last topic I had, just an update on the traffic committee. Um, just want to let you know that the Deputy Chief will be meeting with the traffic committee tomorrow uh, to discuss some areas in town where residents of have reached out and expressed some concerns um, over the past several months. Some of the areas that uh, they'll be addressing include uh, speeding and in increased use in traffic on Rice Road, speeding on Old Still Road came up, uh, speeding on Route 67, and traffic and parking in the area of Newton and Old Mill Road with the, uh, with the start of school. And also requests came up for possible additional signage and posting to postings to de deter traffic violations um, on Route 67 and possibly on um, main thoroughfares that uh, where they enter, uh, enter enter our town. So we've been targeting some of those areas already in response to their concerns with the increased patrols and uh, police present D runs and also putting the speed trailer up there. But um, we'll address it with all those with the traffic committee and keep be advised if. Um, if things don't get resolved there and have to rise. To the that's, the, uh, that's the last thing I had for Trevor. Is there a motion to adjourn? I think that ends our meeting. Motion to adjourn. There's a second. There's a second, Dr. Fried. All those in favor? 
I see. Yes, Trevor, yes. Okay, I see everyone. Steve, are you? We lost Steve. Okay, we have, uh, um, thank everyone for your patience. This was a little bit choppy start, but I, I thank you for the patience and uh, good night. Good night. Thank you, everybody. Good night, everybody.